Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for taking the time to come out and engage around this important conversation today. I'm Simone Marian. I'm the co-CEO and the co-founder of Girls Leadership and thrilled to be with you for this conversation here today. Girls Leadership is a national educational nonprofit with a mission to teach girls to exercise the power of their voice. We are based in Oakland, California, and we run our programs nationally. We have programs for girls, workshops for parents, and run professional development training for teachers, guidance counselors, and nonprofit staff. Our work centers racial and gender equity to address both the internal and the external barriers to girls' leadership development. Today's roundtable is the third in a series to understand the implications of our Ready to Lead research report, which came out in August. Today, we are here to discuss the implications of the findings for the parents and caregivers of Black and Latinx girls and their allies. On May 27th, we'll look at the implications in education and the round, final round table will be in June and we hope that you will join us for those conversations as well. We'd like to thank the sponsor of today's event, Morgan Stanley. Before we begin, we want to acknowledge the land where we are gathered. While we're gathered from all over the country, Girls Leadership is based in Oakland, California. Oakland is the land of the Ohlone people. We remember their connection to this region and give thanks for the opportunity to live, work, learn, and pray on their traditional homeland. Let us take a moment of silence to pay respect to the elders and the Ohlone people past and present. And we invite you to honor the land of the people where you are. Thank you. We invite you to share today's conversation on social. Our handle is at Girls Leadership and today's conversation thread is hashtag ready to lead. Please welcome our moderator for today's conversation, our Chief Program Officer, Dr. Kendra Carr. Kendra joined the Girls Leadership team after almost a decade of work and as an administrator at an all-girls school in Oakland, California. She is deeply committed to girls programming that addresses the needs of all girls, especially those girls at the margins of society. Love, community, humility, equity, and commitment to liberating action are the values that guide her work with youth. Kendra received a BS in political science with a minor in ethnic studies from Santa Clara University and an MA in education with a concentration in equity and social justice from San Francisco State University. She received her doctorate in educational leadership from St. Mary's College of California. Please welcome Dr. Carr. Thank you, Simone, for that introduction. And I also want to extend a warm welcome to all of you who've taken time out to join in this discussion today to our audience members um, and to our panelists today. Um, so like our panelists, um, I am a parent and like many of you in the audience and I very much am looking forward to this dialogue around um, how do we make meaning of the ready to lead research report as parents and how can we use the findings um, to support our advocacy uh, work on behalf of our girls. And so let me take this moment to introduce today's panelists to you who are parents and caregivers of Black and Latinx children. Um, they are also advocates, community organizers, educators, and leaders. So first, we welcome Olivia Arisa, who is the program director for the UC Berkeley Othering and Belonging Institute's Network for Transformative Change, where she supports a new movement to transform and penetrate our most pressing societal issues. Previously, Olivia served as the executive director at Justice Matters, a racial, orga racial justice organization based in Oakland, California, which brought together her background as a daughter and sister of immigrants, a mother, community organizer, and policy analyst. She dedicated herself to changing the conditions communities of color experience at public schools by combining critical public policy analysis with powerful community organizing for educational justice. 
Olivia is a first generation college grad that benefited from Head Start and affirmative action programs and policies. Welcome, Olivia. Next, I'd like to introduce Genji Faith Heiston, the CEO and co-founder of Blaze Consulting Group. Genji is a mother, entrepreneur, innovator, servant leader, ordained minister, and author with over 25 years of experience in the education and human services arenas. With Blaze Consulting Group, Genji provides coaching to build the capacity of public and nonprofit organizations. She was the founding executive director of Saving Our Sisters, Saving Ourselves, a youth development program that was invited to school districts throughout the San Francisco Bay Area and served hundreds of girls. Genji's work in schools has focused on supporting the holistic needs of the child. Her sons, nieces, and nephews inspire her to work tirelessly on dismantling systems and structures that would threaten their well being. Welcome to you, Genji. And our third panelist this afternoon is Sam Lalane, the Global Head of Diversity and Inclusion for Morgan Stanley's Inst Institutional Securities Group. In this role, Sam helps drive diversity and inclusion initiatives with a focus on improving diversity representation, advancement, and retention. Sam joined Morgan Stanley from Citi, where he had a distinguished career spanning 19 years. During his tenure at Citi, he held various leadership roles, including head of fraud management, head of group information security, and head of vendor management for the North America Private Banking Division. Most recently, Sam served as Senior Vice President in the Global Diversity and Talent Organization, where he was focused on building enterprise-wide, data-driven diversity efforts for the firm. Sam lives in Brooklyn, New York with his wife and two daughters. Welcome, Sam. And Olivia, Jinji, and Sam, it's just an honor um, to be in the space with you. And I'm gonna turn it over to, to, for your opening reflections in just a moment. But this afternoon, we're discussing the Ready to Lead report. So I'd like to take a moment to just share a brief overview of the study and um, the key findings. So we at Girls Leadership, we wanted to know what factors support and promote the leadership of girls of color and what factors inhibit their success. So the study met methodology, um, the data was collected in two phases. And the first phase consisted of six focus groups with middle and high school girls across the country. And then the second phase co consisted of online surveys. So we surveyed 2012 girls who were ages 12 to 18 years old. And the survey was created from focus group data and also the ROTES rating scale for leadership. And we'll reference that also a little later. But the questions re revolved around how they perceived um, if you go back for one moment, <laughs> the questions revolved around how they perceive their own leadership abilities and readiness. And then we also um, surveyed 601 middle and high school teachers. Thank you. Next slide, please. And here are some of the key findings from this study. First of all, Black and Latinx girls are ready to lead. So across all income levels, Black and Latinx girls are the high scorers for leadership. So this question here was one from the ROTES rating scale for leadership. Do you agree with the statement, I am a leader? 48% of black girls and 36% of Latinx girls said yes. So they are more likely to identify as leaders than their white, Asian and multi-ethnic peers. Next slide, please. This data point is around leadership aspirations and skills. So black and Latinx girls are more likely to have leadership aspirations and skills in comparison to their white, Asian and multi-ethnic peers. And Black and Latinx girls are also more likely to seek leadership opportunities, and they report having more leadership opportunities than their peers. Next slide, please. The study also found that families and communities develop strong leaders. So when asked how important it is to have leaders as role models who look like them, Black and Latinx girls agree that's very important to have leaders who look like them, who are of the same race or, or, or ethnicity at higher rates than their peers. And also a significant finding was that Black and Latinx parents are, are most likely to identify as leaders out of all the ethnic groups. And so the study found that when parents identify as leaders, their girls also report having more leadership skills. Next slide, please. Um, and then this final data point um, is around bias, teacher's bias. So, when teachers, per teachers perceived barriers to leadership for Black and Latinx girls were not actual deficits. For example, teachers perceived 
lack of confidence as a barrier. But Black and Latinx girls actually have the highest levels of reported confidence. So teachers perceived that girls of color had internal barriers to leadership that were in fact um, contrary to how girls of color viewed themselves. And so we wanted to share those few data points with you as we begin this conversation. And so I'd like to now turn the mic over to the panelists um, and just give you a chance to share your reactions to the report findings. And, and I wanna ask if you can share a personal experience for your life or in your work with girls, uh, maybe parent advocacy work. So we'll just begin with like what your, what's your reaction to the report findings? And anyone can go. I'm happy to kick it off. Uh, thank you, Kendra. And, and thank you on behalf of Morgan Stanley. Thank you for having me here today. And it's so nice to be with you and Simone and Olivia and Genji sharing this uh, virtual panel stage with you all. Uh, so for me, first, when I read the report, my immediate reaction was when I looked at the key findings was yes, yes, yes. You know, so many of these points resonated with me as, um, as a son of uh, a very strong mother, a mother that led in all aspects of her life and continues to do so to this day. Uh, two older sisters that uh, were role models to me growing up and, and did so much for me growing up. So there's a personal connection there that I can resonate with. Then as you mentioned in your opening comments, also as, as a father, a father of two young black girls that are, are caring, are loving, but I would also describe as ready to lead. So when I read these findings, it, it resonated from a personal experience. And then you add in the intersection of just the role that I'm in, um, as you mentioned in the opening comments and corporate America and leading uh, diversity inclusion efforts uh, for division at Morgan Stanley. It resonates with the work that we do. I am surrounded by uh, women, black and Latinx women in particular, that are leaders. So I know it to be true. I see it, I feel it. I have a team of uh, four black and Latinx women and they are leaders. And they are leaders in various facets, not just in the work that they do, but in their personal lives and society, the way they give back, the way they uh, lead with their values. Uh, so when I read this, it, it all made sense to me. Um, so I completely resonate with the leadership piece. Uh, the other aspect of it that you highlighted briefly is the role that bias plays. Uh, we know that bias exists all throughout society, uh, not just in the school system, not just with our young ones, but with adults across different demographic groups here in the United States, but all across the world of different shapes and sizes and forms. Uh, and we know the impact that bias can have on, on all people. And when you extrapolate that with what we're focusing on or Black and Latinx young uh, girls, we see the impacts that it can have at an early stage of their life and think about the impact that will have down the line. So that was my immediate takeaway, Kendra, that I'd like to share. Thank you, Sam. Thank you for getting us kicked off. Jinji, Olivia, would love to hear. Sure, thanks, Jinji. Um, thanks um, for inviting me to be a part of such an important panel this topic of girl leadership, girls leadership is so important, especially today as we're facing bigger, more challenging problems globally than we ever have possibly. And, and, and so leadership is a, a critical um, kind of path to, to solve um, these problems that we're, we're facing kind of locally and globally. And if um, we're not, not tapping into the potential leadership of Black and brown, black and Latinx girls. I think that we um, are making a terrible, terrible mistake. Um, so that's kind of one. So you know, thank you for for your organization, for your work on this topic, and for carrying out this study. I mean, I guess I would say it's validating first and for foremost, uh, having come up in public schools. Um, as a Chicana, I know that some of the stories, some of the data points that were there. Um, brought up all sorts of stories um, from my childhood um, coming up through the schools and unfortunately from stories that 
you know, some anecdotes that I could share regarding my daughter's experience coming up through school schooling right now too. Um, just a personal anecdote that's kind of tied to expectations or this, you know, this gap between where how teachers perceive um, girls of color compared to how girls of color perceive themselves is so problematic. It's such a big problem. So the story is this, um, some schools use AR reading tests to motivate kids to read and to support them to, to read and kind of track their progression, how they're doing on reading. Um, and I think this was in a uh, second grade, they started with my daughter doing this. I'm not a big fan of it, but some kids like it. She was one of them that kind of hesitated and was really nervous about taking this test on the computer to, you know, to, to measure um, her reading um, skills. And she was seeing some kids that were doing really well and thrived in that kind of environment were going up and up and up. And my daughter is an avid reader. And anyway, she decided one day, okay, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm like, all right, cool. Let's do it. Let's go and let's stay after school. And you're going to, you know, do this AR test. Your teacher really wants you to do it. And She's like, and I'm going to do Harry Potter. I'm like, all right, cool. Do Harry Potter, the first book. I think that's great. She's like, yeah, because if I take it, then I'm going to get to the top of the list. <laughs> it was one book only. <laughs> and <laughs> because of, I guess they, I don't know, it's a, it's a higher grade level book. And so you, you score higher, right? And so um, we go in and she tells her teacher, okay, I'm going to take the test and it's Harry Potter. And the teacher sits her down and, and she comes outside to talk to me alone. She's like, you know, I don't know how she's going to do on this. So um, afterwards, I'm really just going to encourage her to, you know, pick another book at her level. And so I was outside, I'm like, man, I can't believe I'm like setting up my daughter to have this experience. Like she finally got the courage to take this test and I didn't like push her, you know, to do another book, you know, just to figure out what this program looks like. And I hope, you know, now she's kind of set up to fail. Anyway, she comes out totally happy, scored, nailed it, 10 out of 10 or hundred out of hundred, whatever the thing, the scale was, but <laughs> she nailed it. And so it doesn't only impact girls, um, it impacts parents because for a second there, I was like, wait, maybe <laughs> I didn't do my job right. Um, so it's important, it's important for kids, it's important for teachers and all adults in schools um, and for parents too, because as you can see, black and brown girls through your study um, were aligned with how their mothers or their adults in their lives saw themselves and vice versa. And when there's this big mismatch that's really due to racial biases, um, it stunts leadership potential. So those are kind of my opening thoughts. Um, thanks for asking. Appreciate that, Olivia. Thank you for sharing. And, and Jinji. Thank you, Olivia and Sam, you've said so much. I'm like, yes, yes, yes. So I wanna first start by saying that I wanna acknowledge all black and Latinx women in the room who have read this report and have found themselves as girls in the report because we weren't tripping when we thought we were being stereotyped, when we thought the system was designed against us, when we got our voices muted and stolen from us in middle school and high school because we appeared to be hostile or angry or aggressive. And I like what one of the young girls says on page 40. She said, we're um, authentic as leaders. We speak with candor and we have heart. And so I wanna take a moment to just acknowledge all of us that lost a little bit of our voice. And I'd like to acknowledge, and thank you so much for having me here, Kendra and Girls Leadership and Takai, because I really wanna acknowledge as someone who I train hundreds of hours with people around anti-racist work, undoing systems, undoing structures from the banking system to the educational system, to housing, to the medical system. And what this report revealed to me that I can use for evidence in all those systems is that black and Latinx girls have been labeled since they were in middle school and high school. And so when you look at the labeling that has been done, there's a stark contrast between the way we as black and Latinx girls are seeing ourselves 
and white educators in particular are seeing us. That is a systematic problem that is evidence that we are not broken. That there is not, we are not the problem, but that the system that is afraid of our strength and our power and our courage and our voice is the problem. So I wanna lift that up because I think that is, as I was listening, reading this over and over and I got this aha moment, I now as a black woman who grew up in poverty, I went to 10 different schools before college, but I had a mother who worked hard, loved me deeply and tried her best. She was judged by many white educators because it didn't look the way that they thought our life should look. But I think I turned out pretty okay and I'm, I'm pretty loud because my mother was the mentor I needed. It was actually not the educator that thought that she knew math better than my mother, but it was my mother or my aunties and mentors who actually were like, speak, baby, speak. Mm -hmm. And so this report is foundational evidence to why those of us who are undoing systematic oppression in organizations are dealing with a lot of white leadership that is now saying, how do we work with angry black women? Mm -hmm. One of the reasons my company is so busy is because we help people understand how to work with black women that they and Latinx women that they feel uncomfortable with. Here's where this links to the report. If the evidence shows that black girls publicly are put down, are muted, are told they are too loud, they are too angry and aggressive between them and the teachers. There are students who are also watching that, that are now acquiring biases that when they matriculate out of um, the educational system, whatever, into the public workforce, that they are bringing those biases into their organizations. It is a system-wide illness that I think this report proves for us as Black and Latinx girls is rooted in an educational system that needs to be deconstructed. And I tell all people I work, this is the carpe diem moment. We've never lived through a revolution and a pandemic at the same time. So this is the perfect moment to rewrite this, to tear it down, and to empower our girls. And so when I think about Latinx mothers and Black mothers and aunties and mentors, if the school systems are afraid of our daughters, they sure can't handle us. Mm. But this is the season where here we come. And this report can be used from, from a parent standpoint who may not have a, a college education all the way to superintendents. Um, and I think that the report should not only be used in study in districts, but I think that districts in particular should run the report within their own school districts, the um, data, or excuse me, the um, survey to see where their staff stand. Um, Black and Latinx girls aren't broken. They are dope. Oof. <laughs> but you all, thank you for these comments. And Genji, I want to underline, we are okay. We are in a toxic system, but we are okay. You said that before. And Sam, you talked about seeing leaders, leaders in your family, your mothers, um, the other women in your family and in your colleagues. Um, and Olivia, you talked about leadership as a tool for community change. And then I'm just appreciating these experiences that you shared of bias with like low expectations, low expectations and labels um, that many of our girls have. And so I, you know, for, the sake, I'm wondering if you can just share also, what do you see as um, like what patterns of bias have you seen in school or what are the most challenging, um, most pressing challenges you're seeing for girls of color in schools? And anyone can. Um... I'll, I'll go first. Um... Thanks, Kendra. So it's, it's the fact that it doesn't start later in life. It starts earlier in life. And so it, it becomes a, a systemic pervasive issue from the very beginning of development of young Black and Latinx girls throughout their life. So if they are ready to lead, whether you're in elementary school or as the survey began in middle school into high school, and those opportunities to lead are not there, or they're not recognized, or the opportunities are not given, or they're not supported, uh, then that's gonna have a downstream impact over time. So it's recognizing that there's a point where it's too late, right? So we have to start early with our young ones 
in creating atmospheres of support, atmospheres of empathy, understanding, and in recognizing that Black and Latinx girls have courage, they have strength, and they have leadership skills that, as your report suggests, are, they're just waiting to let out. Um, and if we, if we thwart that, if we, if we limit the abilities for those skills, those traits, those qualities to play a part in our greater society, uh, then that's only gonna have a disastrous or impactful consequence, negative impact down, downstream. Yeah, thank you, Sam. Yeah, I think, you know, um, just picking up uh, on, on um, what Genji, what you're talking about, um, these preconceived notions that we're broken, that we need fixing, that we need help, that we need to be saved um, are so damaging. And, um, and I think, you know, that schools think of, of children like that and, and they blame parents um, for it. They blame the communities that they come from for it. Um, and, and they don't see the leadership that parents and families and adults um, in our communities have and what we have to offer. Um, it, it's, you know, the whole deficit versus asset um, kind of framework of, of looking at what's happening in schools. And, um, you know, you have teachers asking parents to, you know, come for a field trip, come for this, come for that. And, and you start seeing kind of the pattern <laughs> of who can and can't for real reasons or what kinds of roles you're asked to fulfill or not. Um, you're never, rarely do you see kind of the, I don't know, the, the, the concrete kind of cement, cement <laughs> layer person, you know, father um, or mother coming and asked to kind of share about, you know, their work. Um, um, and, and I think that's a real problem. And I just really wanted to highlight, um, you know, how damaging it is not to have parents of color at the front of the room talking about their profession, about their jobs, their multiple jobs, um, as something to offer, um, either for a real academic kind of in, in the books, kind of, this is what we're learning about this week or on questions around leadership. Um, and so I, I really wanted to underscore that, um, how that works out in the classroom, but it also works out around the school community. So I've been engaged in the PTA kind of on and off throughout my kids, um, schooling years. And often it's, they, they just, they can't, they're working too hard. They have multiple jobs. It's, it's just, they don't have money. They can't give money. And all of these reasons why um, Black and Latinx parents can't make it, can't turn out, can't help, can't support, or instead of kind of turning it around and saying, well, what, what are the asks? What's the project about? Who informed it? Who got to decide what you know, the agenda is going to be, what the programs are going to be, what the projects are going to be? Um, we do have a lot to give. We give a lot all the time in our communities. It can also happen within the school community or surrounding the school community. So, that, you know, I just wanted to highlight that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Olivia. Great, I'm gonna look at it systematic, but then also as a parent. So as in the system, one of the things I do realize and I've seen you know, through numerous schools is that, and it says in the report, that there just are not enough black and Latinx teachers that um, reflect students. And that does make a difference. And I think school districts just don't do enough on recruiting those groups in particular and paying them what they're worth. And so there is, in the system, there is something that seriously needs to be addressed on how to um, have teacher workforces that resemble the youth that they are serving. That's one. The second part is, oh gosh, this PTA. Olivia, I'm so glad you brought that up. Parents often ask me, how do you get into systems within the school? Especially if your kids are in elementary and middle school and there's a strong PTA, you have to get into that PTA in some way as a Black and Latinx parent. 
that PTA holds a lot of power over what happens at that school, especially on behalf of Black and Latinx students or what does not happen, I should say. And so the PTAs, we don't see diversity, equity, and inclusion folks on there. My kid's school, when we walked into the school, the PTA was all white women. And I walked in there and felt like I walked into the 30s. And I couldn't pull my kids out of the school because it's where we lived. And so my husband and I decided, well, we're going to get to know them and they will get to know us. And so the school did not um, celebrate Martin Luther King Day, period. So they did nothing else. And over time, we created a parent group where they knew who we were. By the time my last son is graduating the school now, they do an oratorical fest every year, basically, around Black History Month. It is the biggest attended by parents, 500 kids. And when they asked our group to put it on, we said, no, teachers have to put this on. And the reason why we said that, because the onus to educate our kids in an academic way is not just on parents, but teachers have to integrate this work within their classroom and they have to be held accountable for that. And so while we can co-collaborate as parents of colors, we have to bring in white teachers and say, you are with our kids this many hours a day. We require that you see them and that you move forward with them. The second part I wanna say, and I wanna tell a story real quick as far as parents out here, is that bring to the table what you have and find someone to link with that has something else. I was the dean of an alternative high school in Alameda um, that was of highly populated with um, African-American and Latinx students. And we were putting together an event and people were like, we can't get the mamas, to, we can't get the families come, we can't get the Latinx community come, right? And one mama came to me and she said, I'm working this many jobs. Just tell me exactly what you need. I said, well, we don't have a food budget. She said, I got this. I said, wait a minute. She said, I may have one piece of rice, but if I call this person and that person and we bring all our pieces of rice, we have a full meal. I said, okay, show me. When they showed up in the way that this group of mothers chose to show up, they did something so extraordinary we couldn't imagine. It didn't fit in the book of what white educators or systems may want, but it was extraordinary. And the pride on their daughter's faces was priceless. And so we've got to go into school systems and begin to redefine what showing up looks like because black and Latinx parents and mothers are doing whatever they can, one, to keep their kids alive and two, to keep themselves going. And so we need to re-look at what parent engagement looks like. The last part I want to say is parents keep showing up. If they're scared because you're loud, keep going. Find an ally, find an abolitionist to stand there with you, but keep going. The evidence is in this report that we've got to keep showing up for our babies. And if we can't show up, send an auntie, a mentor, an uncle, a daddy on their be your behalf. Thank you. Thank you all for that. And you all already started talking about, oh, you have something, Olivia? Go ahead. I do. And <laughs> you know, you. the thing that gets to me is that the this is supposed, I mean, this is our joy. <laughs> our yeah. kids going to school, us participating when we can, showing up. And it just breaks my heart that, you know, we have to struggle for that piece. But everything you talked about, Genji, seeing like the kids looking up at their adults, at their moms, at their aunties, whoever, um, it's their joy as well. But this is kind of a period of our lives that should be so joyful and we cherish it and we all do regardless of our circumstances. So, um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And what I hear both of you, you know, the, what you all talking about is like change um, is up to the school. Like we as parents, we go and advocate, um, we collectively work for change, but it's really up to the school. And so this next question is really around like when schools do adopt like anti-racist policies or start to engage in the work that parents are asking them to engage in, how would you measure progress? Like, how would you say, okay, this school is making progress and doing better on behalf of Black and Latinx girls? Yeah, I, I think that's a, it's a really great place to start. Really great question. You know, Genji's comments earlier around systems, policies, procedures, those are the foundation, the bedrock of where change can happen. So if we're not looking at that to begin with, nothing else we do is going to have the impact that we're lo really looking for. So I do agree that it begins there, mm -hmm. um, but then what? 
right? What's, what's, how do you measure progress over time? Is it, is it changing one policy and just saying, hey, we check the box, it's done. Here's, here's a, you know, we're celebrating Martin Luther King Day, right? It's, it's not just that. Um, so to answer your question in, in simple terms, it's sustained progress over time. If it becomes a one-time exercise in one ear, out the other, or the perspective or the implication that it's a check the box, uh, nothing's going to get done and the perspective of impact is not going to be there from a positive standpoint. So really sustain progress over time. So you know, uh, we talked about anti-racism training. We talked about unconscious bias training earlier. And I, I really think that's really important. Inclusive leadership training and workshops as well for our teachers is another piece that I think jives well and complements the previous two. But if you just do it one time, you attend one two hour session or one half day session, and it's not gonna have the impact because it's gonna be in one ear out the other, or maybe you have a positive reaction to it as a teacher. Maybe say, that was great. I learned some practical points that I can apply in my life and I can apply in the classroom. But if you don't keep it going, three weeks later, it might be gone. Mm. So how do we continue the learning? The same way the curriculum continues. The same way our curriculum evolves year over year, week over week, semester over semester, is how we should apply thinking about how we should be more inclusive leaders in the classroom, how we should have uh, be aware of our biases, we all have them, and be able to understand what those biases are, mitigate those risks, and continue to focus on improving piece by piece by piece. Thank you, Sam. Yes, sustained over time. Genji or Olivia, would you like to? Yeah, yeah um, go for it, Genji. Okay, thanks. So I'll, I'll go with a few, and, and Sam is right on it. I wanna say follow the money trail. So one of the things I know about this work currently when it comes to anti-racism and undoing systems and practices is in this time, people are actually putting money where their mouth is. And so is your school district allocating funds and resources to train teacher, district staff, security, anyone that comes in contact with students and Black and Latinx girls? And so if that is the case, it is a long-term investment. This is not a sprint, it's a journey. We're undoing hundreds of years of internalized external oppression and biases. And so ask your district, what is their three-year plan? A lot of districts are now beginning to do their three-year plan. There are funds coming down from the government. How are they redirecting those funds? That's one. The second one I wanna say is there's policy and protocol have to be addressed, addressed I'm sorry, but culture is what needs to be changed. And culture happens under over time. If a teacher feels like it is okay to say certain things that they think are are not bad, but they are right. They're at their racist thoughts and practices, right? Then that is the culture in the classroom that doesn't, in the moment, get mitigated by the policies and procedures. And culture change means that another teacher will say something. So I want to refer you all, and I see the comments to someone who I think says it's so much better than I can ever say it. Dr. Bettine Love. Um, has a talk called Ally versus Co-Conspirator. And I use this in a lot of my trainings now. She wrote a book called We Want to Do More Than Survive. This, the way she articulates what we need from white people now who will consider some allies or abolitionists is so powerful. And so go ahead and watch that and research that and even read her book. Because what we need now is we need people to stop learning theory and framework and put into practice the things that they have already learned that will change the system. The last thing, Latinx mothers, um, parents, and those who have Black and Latinx children do not wait for the school system to change. By the time the actual system changes, your children will be out of um, 12th grade. Find mentor programs for them. Find online programs for them. The report states that mentors and outside leadership is super impactful for your girls. So while you are forcing systematic change, meet your girls where they're at and give them the tools they need outside of their regular school day so that they are not impacted by a civil rights issue. Yeah, thank you, Gigi. Thank you. Gingy, I'm sorry, I think I said. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, um, I agree with everything 
um, that Sam and Genji were just talking about. I think, you know, the, the art and culture of a community is so important. And, and what are kind of some of the signals, um, the positive mm -hmm. signals or the negative signals and um, have your, um, your gut tuned to those, you're right. <laughs> if you have to get this sense, it, that's, that's probably what it is. If you get a feeling <laughs> and, um, and call it out, you know, don't let it sit, you know, um, if, if, some, if you're on the PTA, if you're at a meeting, if you're, you're working with the teacher, if you're talking to other parents, when you're dropping off or picking up, if you're able to do that, um, and you hear something that's dismissing an entire group of people because of their ethnicity, because of their community, because of their race, call it out <laughs> right there. Don't, don't wait and say, you know what? I, yeah, a lot of people here are struggling right now, but you know, um, they want to be a part of their kids' lives and education as much as we do. Um, and and so I, you know, that, that's just one thing that um, I think needs to happen in any space if you feel comfortable doing that. And, you know, a signal for me um, as an example of a positive one is at the school my kids um, go to, a large school, hundreds of kids, six, 700 kids, maybe 600, 700 kids. Um, you know, the principal knew, I would say pretty much every child's name at the, by the end of the school year. And so impressed by that. And, in, you know, I'm not saying every principal does that or needs to do that or can do that. It might've just been a special gift he had. But to me, that is so incredibly important that a child can walk through the campus and the principal or a teacher or someone else can say hi to them using their first name. So being seen is, is so critical and so important. And, um, you know, so for sure, the teacher pipeline, teacher in service trainings are so important. That has a lot to do with budget, um, accountability, kind of reports like this, and coming up with measures that campuses or districts can use are so important. Paying attention to the roles that kids get assigned or or, or can go after, um, and I think another one that's so important that hasn't been mentioned is leadership roles either as an entire community or that individual girls can jump into and play that are tied to community engagement or community advocacy and change efforts are so important. I think there's a total mismatch between um, the priorities um, and the aspirations that an essentially white-led public school system has compared to the needs and aspirations and visions that Latinx and Black communities have. And so um, making sure that there are real opportunities to plug in to um, community-wide um, visions and agendas is important. And making sure that that's happening is, I think, a good measure <laughs> that there's um, work happening on this front. Yeah. I'm not sure if you all are noticing the chat, but everyone's appreciating these recommendations and this encouragement um, that you're sharing. And so, um, and there are a lot of questions in the Q&A. So I wanna just pose a, a final question then we'll um, see what questions audience members have. But what, um, you know, what is your vision for a school where girls of color are safe, seen and affirmed? What would be your vision as parents for schools where girls are safe? Yeah, to, to start, I think it's it's being able to benefit and leverage and recognize research such as this, the research piece that we're talking about here. It's it's data driven. It's not anecdotes. It's not one per person's personal experience. It is a substantial, robust, deep analysis that's data specific that helps to identify the issue with practical steps on how to solve and mitigate the risk of these issues continuing to increase. So it's recognizing the data behind the research, number one. Number two, it's understanding the role that teachers have in addition just to teaching that uh, the curriculum, but their role as inclusive leaders, as we talked about before. Inclusion is, is really important. How do we look for opportunities to be inclusive in everything within the classroom and outside the classroom at an earlier age to be able to build up, to be able to empower, to be able to support 
young uh, Black and Latinx girls that are looking to lead, that are putting themselves out there, that are trying. And the last thing we want is for that, that effort to be stunted, right? And so one topic that we haven't talked much about just in the interest of time, but the microaggressions that exist, right? The everyday slights and, in, and indignities that uh, people, and in, in this particular example, Black and Latinx girls face in the classroom and beyond that when it happens just once, fine, thick skin, we're tough, move on. But when it continues to happen over and over and over, it has a disastrous, potentially disastrous impact, right? It impacts productivity, it impacts morale, it impacts your ability to want to speak up next time. It impacts your ability to be part of the team, part of the classroom, a sense of belonging as, we, as we've discussed earlier. Uh, so, so that's number two. Um, and then explicitly looking to give girls leadership opportunities. Um, sometimes you have to look for it. You have to, to, to make those opportunities, recognize that those opportunities need to be shared uh, so that you can support and nurture that growth and development. Hmm. Sam, thank you. Jindy, Olivia? Okay. I think Black and Latinx girls are taking leadership positions in their daily lives and at school every single day, and it's happening mm -hmm. all the time. I think that it's not appreciated, and I think sometimes, though, it might be for roles or projects that aren't the ones that are setting the vision, that aren't the ones setting the agenda necessarily, and I think that's the problem. <laughs> I think um, women in general across our lives, across our careers, in schooling or in our jobs are seen as doers and people who are gonna get the job done. And that's because we do. But there's a difference between that and saying, I'm gonna be a creative social change maker right now and I'm gonna envision and I'm gonna lead a process with a lot of people like me and not like me to decide where we wanna to get to. And I think that's a huge difference that I would add to this. Mm -hmm. um, that it's not take the leadership position on the fundraising to get money to go to this place that someone else already decided where we're going to go <laughs> or what we're going to do with it. And I think that's the problem. We're turned to to do things. We're turned to to fix things. We're turned to to get the job done. And our leadership skills are used in that. And yet our girls are imagining an entirely different world. And that's what we need right now. Yes the vision shapers, the dreamers, yeah. Um, this is super emotional for me when I hear that question. I have a 16 year old niece who lives with me who's currently in high school and a niece who's graduating in middle school. And when I think about them and the girls they go to school with, one, teachers need to be re-educated or educated. One of the things I have found in my anti-racist work across sectors currently is some people just really don't understand the microaggressions that they um, put out there. They don't understand the biases. Some of us come from oppressed groups, so we understand oppression in a way that people who have had privilege don't. And so there does need to be training around, as Sam said, microaggressions, systematic oppression, the educational system. We can't just assume that people know this stuff, that we're speaking the same language or the same vocabulary. And so I think that districts need to invest in that type of training. I had a school um, in San Francisco, a very elite school, um, where the principal who's a white male four years ago called me and said, can we go on a journey together? And I've been training his staff for four years, once a month. And it has taken four years to see cultural change within his schools amongst his teacher. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's one. The second is, um, but that's crucial because the onus of change is not on black girl and Latinx girls and their parents. The onus of change is on the education system and the teachers. The second is I want black girls and Latinx girls to be able to show up and not be over-sexualized not be looked at as grown women when they are not. We don't see our girls as grown women. We see them as growing young people. And when people have those lens for our girls on, they then put on them things that they are not ready for or that is not theirs. Let our girls be girls. They will be women soon enough. And when they become transitional age youth, there is another level. But I think when they walk into schools, they put on armor. They strengthen up. 
because they already know the attacks that will come against them from the teachers, from the kids who are reinforcing what teachers are saying, from what media is saying about their bodies and their image. And so I think when we address safety for Black and Latinx girls, we have to look at the whole child, right? And we have to say, how do we not just address what's going on intellectually, but how do we address how the school is treating them? Girls are ready to lead. And here's what I want to say. A soldier's going to be a soldier somewhere. And if you got lead, if you got Black and Latinx girls ready to lead, either they're going to lead in the way we support them in leading, or they're going to lead one way or another. And we usually think about that with our Black and Latinx boys, but our girls are soldiers and warriors too. And they have spirits within them that they are fearless from the ages of 12 to about 24. And they will say and do things that we are now afraid to say and do. And so invest in the warrior child, the spirited girl, the girl who is all, what did, what did my friends are here on page 40? She said, who, who is not afraid of candor, who has heart and who is authentically themselves. Um, and so I think that's when school will be safe. When my nieces can walk into a school and they can be who they are at home, completely at school. Yes, they can bring their full selves, yes. You all have so appreciated this conversation and I know our audience members have too. Um, and so Simone, would you like to bring us some questions from the audience? Um, I know we have a short amount of time, but I'm seeing all of the chat, it's wonderful. Thank you so much. What an incredible, incredible conversation. Um, thank you for all of that. We do have a ton of questions, so let me jump right in. Um, one of them is, what are the recommendations from the panel to help our girls who desire to strive and perhaps also manage the stressors of external non-inclusive bias and balance mental health? Yes, the microaggressions are a good example. So focusing here on the girls in this question. Can you ask that question one more time, please? Yeah, thank you. What are the recommendations from the panel to help our girls who desire to strive and perhaps also manage the stressors of external non-inclusive bias and balance mental health? Mm. Yes, the microaggressions are a good example. Mm. Um, just quickly, find therapists that look like them. Find Black and Latinx women. Mental health is a big deal. I have a current young lady in my life where she has a therapist and I, I don't need to know what they talk about, but she needs to talk to someone. So find a therapist. Um, and the other part is there are mentors on campus. There are amazing Latinx, um, black women, Asian women, abolitionist ally women and men, um, mm -hmm. find other young people who can help. But this topic right here is actually one of the reasons why our girls are killing themselves, are doing things they shouldn't be doing and spinning out because we expect black and Latin ex-girls to be strong, move on and don't cry. And we allow white girls to mm -mm, let them cry, let them break, hold them, put them back together and then let's keep going, so. Thank you for that. All right, does anyone wanna add on or should I go to the next question? I think Olivia oh. okay. and Sam. Oh, go ahead, Olivia. Yeah, no, I mean, similarly, you know, find a practice, whether it's a walk through the park, whether it's going for a swim, sitting at the water's edge, talking to a friend, find out what your rock is. Um, and, 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 and I think that changes over our lifetime. So knowing that that's something that you continuously have to revisit, I think is important. Yeah. I was just gonna add a brief comment about, as Genji mentioned earlier, mentors, as an example, the, the report mentioned that almost half of the girls surveyed have an adult mentor. Um, that was encouraging to read. And that helps us to appreciate that we all can play a part. When we think about those that are in the audience today, I saw some of the questions about what can I do to help? If you don't have a black or a Latin squirrel in your household, what can you do? Well, we can all be mentors in some way, shape, or form. There are wonderful organizations that create those opportunities. There's three that I'm involved with, uh, that we're involved with at Morgan Stanley that, that I know that supports high school age um, uh, Black and Latinx girls. So mentorship, representation, role modeling will help um, someone that's been there before, that understands, that are looking to support these young girls without, any, without asking for anything else right? They're there to support and nurture them. That exists. 
Thank you. All right. Um, our next question is from Arizona. Uh, this uh, dad writes, my daughter in Scottsdale is one of the only, in caps, the only. Uh, teaching her that these things exist are hard for her to grasp or understand until she experiences it. How do I encourage my daughter in the midst of this when she hasn't experienced these issues directly? That's a great question. First of all, um, let's meet our kids where they are, right? And so there are some kids who are more advanced and are ready to learn certain things and deal with it in different ways. As a parent, you have to trust that you know your child. And in knowing your child, find age appropriate things that can show them who they are. I want to start by saying, before you teach Black and Latinx girls how broken the system says they are, show them who they come from. So show them movies and books around Black and Latinx strong women. Give them a strong foundation of their power and their heritage so that when the day comes, because it will, when it would be called into question, they actually know that they come from greatness. We don't start supporting our girls when the system says they're broken. We start supporting them so they can go against the system that says they're broken. Mm. Snaps. Thank you. All right. All right, we have time for another question. Should we ask one last question? Yes. Right. <laughs> um, we have one here that says, um, what are the ways that organizations that are girl focused can leverage these insights? And this one, this part of the question applies to all parents. Do the same ideas, concepts apply for the adults in the lives of girls who aren't teachers? So I'll make, I can say it one more time. What are the ways that organizations that are girl focused can leverage these insights? Do the same ideas and concepts apply for adults in the lives of girls who are not yet teachers? Yeah, I'll, I'll take that one first. Um, one, it's kind of the comment that I made earlier. These insights are, are data-driven insights that help us to appreciate a foundation for how to support uh, young Black and Latinx girls and how to create a development plan that will nurture and support them in their growth. That's that's number one. Uh, but more, more specifically, how I read this report and really what struck, out, struck to me was the intersection of a number of different factors. We talked about the role of teachers. We talked about the role of biases. We talked about the roles of families, caretakers, role models. Now, if you put that all together and you think about how can you create a system and an environment or how can you improve an existing environment along those three points, not in isolation, not um, just one of the three, but together, uh, you can accelerate progress where progress is needed. So I would, you know, ask and encourage organizations to look at a research like this and say, how can you bring these three points together to support these young women? I think I would just underscore, look at the systems, look at the systems that are in place and the cultures that are in place that are creating um, what you're seeing in terms of girl leadership. Um, look at yourself as an adult before asking what's wrong or what's needed among girls um, or their communities. And I think you'll find a lot there. And I wanna to speak to the first part of the question around girl-led organizations. One, girl-led organization, this is our season. This is the moment we've been waiting for. And so this report, take it to your funders. You're about to go into fun. Take it to your funders, show your funders, show them the numbers, mm -hmm. take it to the school districts you serve, right? Be the advocate in the system for young people. And the reason I say take it to your funders is because you do need more resources released to bring in mentors, to bring in more staff members, to figure out how not only to be client serving, which is facing the young people, the girls, but also to figure out how to now use this too as advocacy and evidence. I saw Takai Tyler in San Francisco do it so well for years. The way she would approach the district, the city, the county, it was just warrior mode. And we cannot be afraid to go with evidence because so many people like herself and Dr. Kendra have gone with no evidence and gotten results. And now we have evidence that this, this is our moment. So take the moment. 
I just want to, um, Sam, Gingy, Olivia, you have filled my cup and the cup of everyone here today. I thank you for your generous sharing, for sharing the anecdotes from your personal lives and from your young people's lives and for your work. Um, and I hope that we stay connected, uh, but just thank you for, for, for showing up for us. And I would like to um, hand it over to, to Kai to close us out. Mm, yeah, like Kendra said, I just feel um, so appreciative of you all. Thank you for coming, for sharing your insights and your expertise with us. I mean, I've written down so many gems of what you said. Uh, I wish this conversation could just go on for such a long time because it's such a necessary conversation. But thank you, Sam, Olivia, Genji, for showing up for our girls today. Um, again, I want to just appreciate Morgan Stanley for the sponsorship of the roundtables looking at this ready to lead research and the implications in so many sectors. Um, for our audience and our um, participants who came out today, if you want to know more about girls leadership and the work that we're doing, please check us out, go to our website um, to see the programs that we're offering. Um, and I did want to share a little bit about our upcoming program. So we do provide professional development training, what Jinji talked about in terms of working with educators, teachers, district administrators, nonprofit workers. So we have an upcoming workshop on May 19th. We hope that you'll sign up and join us. If there is a girl in your life and you want to go with her to practice social emotional learning skills, you want to support her leadership development, then sign up for one of our Girl Grown Up workshops. And those are starting um, May 25th and 26th. And then this summer, we'll be having online and in-person day camps for girls in fourth through eighth grade. So again, we, if there's a girl in your life and your family and you want her to be able to have an opportunity this summer to come into community, to come into a healing space with other girls to explore her leadership, we invite you to join us there. So just thank you all so much. Our next um, round table related to our research will be on May 27th when we'll be focusing on the educational system. We hope that you'll come out and join us then. So in the meantime, I hope you have a great afternoon. Thank you for being a part of our community. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Everyone, bye. Bye.